All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm, um, I'm Erica Allen. I'm one of the pastors here at Horizon Church. We've been in a series the last two uh, messages. This is the third one that will wrap it up about relationship, relationships. And this whole series has been about this moment right now, about the lover, the greatest lover of all time. It's not you or the person you fell in love with or lost love with or whatever. That's not the greatest lover of all time. The greatest lover of all times is God. And we are going to talk about keeping promises. We're going to talk about marriage. But we are going, going to root it and ground it in knowing about and who the greatest lover in the whole world is. And that is God who is made known to us. Through God, the Father, Creator, Christ, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. We're going to learn about, um, about what God's love offers to us in the midst of our promises, our relationships, and our marriages. Um, you all are getting a worksheet right now. So I've told you this whole series that there is no series that I've ever, ever shared with you all that is more important than this one. And it is because more than ever in our lives, anybody turn on the news this week? My goodness, more than ever in our lives, we are divided. We are divided. But God's vision for our future is that we are united, that we are united. And it is in our relationships with one another that we can be used to build God's kingdom here and today. And so we've talked about friendships, and, and we've talked about family relationships, and today we're going to talk about promises and marriages. And you're like, I'm not, if there are some of you sitting here who are like, I'm not married, and I have no idea um, what you're talking about or why you're going to talk about this today, you may not be married, but perhaps God's plan for your life is that you will get married. Some of you in this place will be single you have been called to a life of singleness. That's what God has set you apart for, and that is fine. And we will celebrate you in this church. And Carol preached three or four weeks ago about um, God's call to some of us to be single in our lives, that you can accomplish more for the kingdom and for God's purposes because you're not married. Some of you, that's God's dream for your lives, and you'll find fulfillment and fullness and wholeness in that. But some of us in this room are called to marriage. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because when our marriages are healthy, it does good things. It builds good things for the kingdom. So you all have gotten this worksheet. I want you to think today about plants. So in Psalm chapter 1, David, this guy who's done terrible things in the world, he like broke up another person's marriage, he, made, he killed the husband of that woman, he, he did some pretty terrible things. David was still loved deeply by God. So before we start anything else, before we go any further this morning, I want you to know that whatever your relationship status is, you, you, not just the person you're sitting beside or near, not just the person you're, you're dreaming about right now, that you are deeply loved by God. Deeply loved by God. And if you can ground and root yourself in that, it is going to help your marriage and your relationships. You, you are deeply loved by God. No matter what you've done, no matter what shame or pain or grief you bring with you this morning, you are deeply loved by God exactly who you are and how you are right now. But God loves you so much. God loves you so much. God's plan is not for you to stay this way. God's plan is for you to grow in God's goodness and offer goodness to the world around us. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in our marriages in just a second. But I need to start with, if you come here with divorces or breakups or whatever, I need you to know that I don't care about any of that and neither does God. In this moment, right now, we are here in this moment, and you need to know, if you don't hear anything else, that you are deeply loved by God, so loved by God that God doesn't want you to remain the way you are, but wants to grow your roots deep in his love for you, that you may grow as a plant that's offering goodness to the world around you. That is God's dream 
for you. So we are going to look at this plant. In Psalm chapter 1, David says um, that he, want, he, he cries out to God. He's writing this like hymn, this praise to God. And he says, I want to be like a tree planted by a stream. I think that's your dream for me, God, that I'm rooted deeply in your goodness and love. And that I'm growing like a tree, offering fruit and goodness and shade to the kingdom, to the world, for you and for your glory, God. That, that's what I believe God's dream is for me. That, that's what um, David says in Psalm 1. So we're going to look at how we can do that, how we can root in God's love and offer good fruit to the world. I want, um, if you have your Bibles with me, we're going to read 1 John. I'm going to read a couple verses that aren't actually going to be on the screen. Um, I'm just going to read a couple verses for you before we get started, and then we're going to really dive deep in some verses that will be on the screen in just a minute. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, I'm in my little script Bible again, so just hang with me. Um, it says, and, and we have seen and testify. So John is writing this to, to the early church, and he says, We have seen and we can testify, we can share this with the world, that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So we can be rooted and grounded in God's love because he loved us so much that he sent his only Son to save us from all of the things that keep us from being in this moment and in the moment with our family and our friends and our marriages. He loves us so much that he sent his son to be the savior of the world, saving us from all of those things that rob us of joy and peace. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, if anyone acknowledges that God loves us so much that he sent us Jesus to, as his son to die on a cross and raise again above all of the things that, that weigh us down, the pain and shame of our world. If we know that, acknowledge that, root ourselves deeply in that love, then God lives in us and us in God. So if you want to be rooted deeply in God's love, simply acknowledge that, Jesus, that God loves us so much that God sent us Jesus as an example of what love looks like in the world. It recognizes and sees the unseen. Jesus spent his life doing that. It, it creates miracles and abundance in places where scarcity has reigned. His first, Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding. A wedding. Marriage is important to God and to Jesus. And he recognizes abundance and love in places where we haven't seen this. Now I want you to listen to, the, to verse 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Verse 16 here. And so we know. We know because of who Jesus was. Because Jesus died on the cross and raised again from the dead. Defeating all of the things that you're sitting there telling me you're not lovable for. God's already defeated that through Jesus Christ. So we know that. And we rely on the love God has for us in Jesus. I don't know what you've relied on this morning before you got here. But before we go any further, it is very important that you understand that in order to live in God, to be rooted and grounded in this love, we have to completely and totally rely on God's love offered to us through his son, Jesus Christ. We have to do that. And so if you will, pray with me for just a second and we'll keep on going this morning. God, so many of us here have relied on our own abilities this morning. We come here relying on the money and our bank account or on the news to give us comfort and happiness and peace, God. And this morning, I, I just want us to start out by saying we want to rely on you and your love. And we pray that in this moment you will show us what that looks like. Show us what that looks like. Amen. Amen. So... If you'll get out your worksheet, you are four times as likely to remember things if you write it down. So that's why we've been really intentional to write um, a lot of stuff down in this message series because it's so important. So promises are important to God. It's a way that God shows us. I love it. God promised people for thousands of years that he was going to send the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That the people were looking for it and looking for it and looking for it. And God fulfilled God's promise by sending us Jesus. And then God exceeded the promise by causing Jesus to die on the cross and raise again above sin and death and all the things that weigh us down. 
That is what our promises to one another as Christians should be rooted in. It is what the promise of marriage should be rooted in. And we're going to talk about that at the very end. But the first two promises that I want to talk about are cultural or worldly promises which will distract us from the promise that God wants us to have for our marriage. The first promise, the first promise that we so often make in the world is a casual promise. So I want you to go ahead and write that in that first box on the left. The first kind of promise that we make is a casual promise. A casual promise. Casual means like not really caring. Um, you know, if, you're, if it's casual day at work, you don't wear your best. You wear your jeans and your hoodie, right? Like casual means you sort of just tone it down a little bit. So many of us are in relationships or marriages that are casual. And that promise, that kind of promise is rooted in mutual complacency. Mutual complacency. It's this, I don't really care. If we have a date night this month, great. If it doesn't work out, it's okay. Right? We get really comfortable and okay with where things are right now in our relationship because it's a casual promise. It's a casual promise. And that turns into a lot of other things. Anybody here heard of people in open relationships? There's no such thing as an open relationship. It hurts us when we casually promise, oh, we're just going to talk and see where this thing goes. If there are some of you in here who are dating right now, there is nothing that will ruin your relationship like a casual promise. Because it doesn't take much to interfere into those places where there is openness in your relationship. It causes lots of things that are unhealthy to flow in there. So a casual promise is mutual complacency. We don't really care. Everything's fine. We're not, whatever happens, happens. We're not going to be really intentional. It's the opposite of intentionality, right? It's just whatever happens. And the fruit of those, the fruit of that relationship, the reason so many folks have casual relationships is because the fruit of that is convenience and comfort. So beside that apple, right, convenience and comfort. The, the, the fruit of relationships rooted in this mutual, I don't really care, it's all going to work out, it'll be fine. The fruit of that is comfort and convenience. And here's the problem with that. It works for a little bit, right? It feels good for a while until it doesn't anymore. Because comfort and convenience depend on circumstances. And if you are rooted like the tree that David says, if you have these shallow roots and this complacency and you don't really care, there's no need to go deep. There's no, good to be, there's no need to be intentional. You just have these sort of shallow roots up on the surface and you are completely and totally dependable on circumstances. So if something bad happens, things in your marriage don't work out exactly like you think, it, it almost tears the plant completely out of the ground and you can't offer fruit because it will wither away. Convenience and comfort. Maybe some of you are sitting here and are like, you have no idea, Pastor Erica. We've been married for 15 years. We have three kids and there's no such thing as mutual complacency. It is just grinding and working hard every day and trying to survive the day. It, that is exactly what leads you to mutual complacency. That is exactly what leads you to mutual complacency because you are, you're just totally fine with the way things are going and you don't see any need to go deep and be intentional with things. So casual promises are, are rooted in mutual complacency, this mutual, I don't really care, whatever happens, happens, it'll be fine. And the fruits of that is convenience and comfort and circumstance will pull you out of the ground and wither you very fast. It is not what you want to root your relationship in. It will feel good for a while. The comfort and convenience will feel good for a while, but it will not last. The second kind, so over in the other one, the second kind I want you to write about is a contractual promise. So a contract promise, okay? A contract promise. And this one made so much sense when I was studying about it this week because a contract promise is built in mutual distrust. Mutual distrust. So 
think about it. You go to buy a house. My friends who are realtors sell you a house. You go to buy a house. And are they going to take their client and you as a client and say, y'all just shake on it, and they're going to get you the money when it you know, when they get it and everything's going to be fine. That's not how contracts work. Why? Because I don't trust somebody else to pay me whatever amount my house is, right? You need a contract. So a contract, what do you do? You sign on the dotted line. You sign on the dotted line. We are past the days of playground promises where we pinky promise, where we shake on it. We have gotten past those days because we don't trust one another to fulfill our obligations. And this happens in our marriages, in our relationships, because we don't trust one another. We don't trust one another, and the fruit of this is rules and consequences. Rules and consequences. I didn't say boundaries. I think boundaries are really healthy for relationships. I said there's rules and consequences when we mutually distrust one another. And you're like, I'm not buying a house. Like, I'm married to this person. But think about it. When you don't get your way, what do you do? You threaten, right? Or you yell, or you fuss. You tell your spouse, like, if you'll do these things, then I'll do this. You start saying a lot of if-then statements to your spouse. Rules and consequences. Rules and consequences. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. When you are rooted in a mutual distrust of one another, again, you've got shallow roots. Your fruit is rules and consequences. And guess what? The world's not super into rules and consequences right now, so the fruit you're offering to the world isn't that good. And in your marriage, it doesn't take very much to, again, knock that plant out. Because there's a point to which you've given and given and given, and you don't feel like you're getting anything back, and you give up. You don't even recognize the water or the goodness around you anymore. You've been pulled and tugged by someone who won't meet any rule or consequence so much that you just give up. And give up kind of people are not what God needs to build God's kingdom. If your marriage or relationship is built on threats and rules and consequences, it is not going to take much to shake that tree loose and it wither up and not offer very much to the world. If I keep the kids this day, you keep them this day. You start putting all these boundaries in place. A, contra a, contra a contract promise, a contract agreement will not produce what it is God wants to produce in the world. I, I want y'all to turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. We know and rely on the, God, on the love God has for us. This is what John tells the church. We know and rely on God's love for us. That's what I'm putting my roots in. God is love. God is love. The Hallmark Channel is not love. Hinge is not love. Tinder is not love. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. And God in them. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. People in contractual relationships get really nervous when it comes judgment time, when it comes intentional conversation time. They're getting nervous and hiding all their stuff and trying to look perfect and right in front of somebody. That's what happens in a contractual agreement. But in a... a a, lo a love rooted in God, we have confidence on the day of judgment. We stand up proud of what it is we bring to the relationship. We have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, in this world that 
says you can be anything else. You can have open relationships and be happy. You can be casual about your marriage. It's just a piece of paper. You can create tons of rules and consequences in your relationship so your spouse or your partner does exactly what it is you say. But, on, but in this world, we're not like that. We're not like that. We're like God. There's no fear in love. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Are you insecure and unsure? Your relationship may need to be rooted in God's love because perfect love roots out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment, with rules and threats and consequences. And the one who fears, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. The relationship, the promise that we need is rooted in God's love, which is a covenant promise. A covenant promise. It's different than a contract. Because we show up, you and I, show up in a relationship with God being exactly who it is we are. And God trusts you to be the person God has created you to be. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to bring your resume with you. You simply get to stand before God who looks at you and says, I trust you to live out the purpose I have for you to build this kingdom. Covenant promise is rooted, it is rooted in the holy, write this down, the covenant promise is rooted in the holy promise of God. The word holy means set apart. It is completely different than the idea of love that the world has given us. Holy love is set apart. And First John, John told us what to expect from Jesus, from God, right? It, the holy covenant that God made with us is made known in Jesus because God showed up with everything God had. And he gave us Jesus to walk and live and show us love. And then when that wasn't enough for us, God showed up even more. And he gave us Jesus who died on a cross and rose again above sin and death. So when he looks at you, he sees not sin and pain and shame and death, but he looks at you and he sees promise and goodness and kingdom builders. And that is the love that we are asked to show up with in covenantal promises of marriage. It is a holy and set apart covenant of God between two people who will live in a way that is set apart. In a world where everybody else is afraid to look their husband or their boyfriend or their wife or their girlfriend or whatever in the face and is afraid to say, ah, I lost my job this week. A holy covenant, a promise isn't wiped out by circumstances. The promise isn't casual when you lose your job. The promise isn't contractual. I didn't say I was going to be married to you because you make this much money. I am here because the way you show up, even when circumstances in life cause us to go awry, I believe God has a purpose for you. And I see God's goodness at work in you. You've experienced grief or pain or loss, a, a terrible medical diagnosis. When you are rooted in the holy covenantal promise of God, you don't walk away because things aren't perfect. You are rooted and grounded in a love that offers everything to us. God literally is standing before you right now and looking at you and saying exactly the way you are and what you have to offer is good. You have a mighty purpose. You are loved mightily by me. God shows up right now wanting that kind of relationship with you. And then in that relationship, when we become rooted and grounded in that relationship, that is what kind of love God asks us to show up with to our spouse in a holy covenantal promise. It is so different 
than the promises that we've been taught in the world. It is deeper and more powerful than that. It is super intentional, right? It's super intentional. It's not, oh, if it happens, no. It is rooted and grounded in ev- like this relationship that we, ha- we like seek after and want to be a part of. It's not, contr- it's not casual. It's not a contract. It's a holy covenantal relationship. I need to be really clear. One in three people are in abusive relationships. And if you are one of those people, I don't think that God's holy covenant of promise is asking you to stay in an abusive relationship. If someone continues to step on your boundaries, to hurt you, and you can't stand before them just as you are and feel like you are good enough or offer enough, it might be time for you to find a relationship where you are safe enough to do that because that is the kind of relationship where the fruit, the fruit of a holy covenant relationship is a place where you can show up just as you are and there is a deep understanding of purpose. The fruit is a deep understanding of purpose. It is a place where your hopes and dreams are offered to the world and celebrated with goodness. And if you are scared to show up just as you are in your relationship, I want you to know, I want you to know that we at Horizon Church want to get you the help that you need for your relationship. There may be redemption and restoration for your marriage, but there may also need to be some other interventions. And I just want to say that to you and let you know that, okay, this morning. But I also want you to know, I also want you to know that in our marriages, when we start showing up with this holy promise of God, when we start showing up rooted and grounded in that, we start showing up in different ways in our marriage, in ways that build the kingdom and offer a different way of living in the world. I need to just say something really, just be real real with y'all this morning. First of all, I hope that all of you will start your small groups this week. We think it's important, vitally important for everybody here to be in a small group. And I hope that you'll start your small group this week by reading 1 John chapter 14 through, through 18. Sit down and take some time, read those words together and talk about it for a few minutes with your group before you get started on the normal topics that you have. And the second thing that I want you to, I want you to be doing that in your small groups this week. I see some of our small group leaders here. I want you to do that. And the second thing, the second thing that I want you to do is I want you to be really honest with yourself. Are you relying on God's love in your life? Is that what you're rooted in? Because unlike all of the other relationships or things you've showed up for, I want you to know that you can stand before a holy and set-apart God just as you are and be loved and celebrated in the purpose that God has for you. I want you to know that this morning. Will you pray with me? God, I pray over the marriages and relationships of people here this morning. I pray that they will not be rooted in contracts, or casualness, God, but they will be deeply rooted in your holy and set-apart covenant of a courageous and vulnerable love. And I pray that as we show up in our relationships and our marriages, God, with that kind of love, with that kind of trust of people who are keeping promises, I pray that you will start to build a new kingdom in us and through us. Amen.